Today at our church, we're, we're remembering something sad. Yesterday was the sad anniversary of the Roe versus Wade decision that legalized abortion in the United States. It's so over the last 49 years, millions of human beings have had their lives cut short too soon. Today in our service, we're going to talk about abortion, but not just about abortion, even more. We're going to talk about God's love for life. God's love for every human life. And our prayer is that God's word confirm in us this love that God has for us and that God's word leads us to see every life as a gift from God. May God bless us as we hear his word together. On page three in your worship folder, you'll see our, our verse of the day from Psalm 139. Let's read that verse together. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So I'd sing our opening song, I Am Jesus, Little Lamb. Psalm 139, responsibly. As we do this, notice how this psalm expresses how closely God knows us, and especially how it was God who created us. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, the light will become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to me. 
How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. God's knowledge of us and the intimate way He created each one of us is a great comfort to us. But it also means that God knows everything we've ever thought or said or done. That's why every church service we, we start by confessing our sins to God. Please stand and we'll join in the confession on page 5. Dear friends, we've come into the presence of God by whose very hand we are each fearfully and wonderfully made. We've come to listen to God who spoke the heavens and the earth into existence. We've come to humbly acknowledge his rightful claim on our bodies, lives, and souls as our creator, savior, and sanctifier. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The Lord has forgiven your sins. The Bible says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join in singing the, the song of praise, How Great Thou Art.
seated. And I'll read our lessons from God's Word in the Bible. Our first lesson is from the very first book of the Bible, the first chapter, Genesis chapter 1. God showed His love for life by creating everything, but in a special way, by creating human beings, male and female, in His image. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is God's word. God made this perfect creation. When he was done with Adam and Eve, it was very good. Unfortunately, as we look around at the world today, is it still very good? No. It's sinful. It's broken. But God's love for human beings didn't stop when he created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. His love for us continued when he sent his own son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. That's what we hear about in our second lesson from Romans chapter 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, Shall we be saved through his life? I, think, I don't know if there's a verse in the Bible that describes more beautifully God's love than that verse. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. We were still sinners. Christ died for us. God has this love for life, especially for us as human beings. For a final lesson, sometimes we get this mixed up and we think that God's love is only for certain human beings. Maybe only for adults, only for people who happen to be like us. Our last lesson from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, is a story of when Jesus' disciples tried to keep the children from Jesus. Surely Jesus didn't come for them. And yet, of course, he did. And he welcomed those children to him with open arms. Please stand for our Gospel lesson from Mark, chapter 10. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and bless them. This is God's word. Maybe see that. We're thinking about the value of human life in God's eyes. We're going to sing a song that's pretty new for us. We've sung it a couple times before. It's called, My Worth is Not in What I Own. It reminds us that our worth doesn't come from anything physical we have on earth. It comes from Jesus and his cross where he died for us. So we'll sing, My Worth is Not in What I Own.
invite all the young children who are here today to come on up to the front for our children's devotion. Good morning. It's great to have all you guys here. Thanks for coming to church today. I have a picture of something that's really special, right? But it's a little bit hard to see what it is. So when I show it to you, I want you to, to think if you can pick out what it is. Can you see what that's a picture of? What is it? It's a baby. Yeah, Pearson, it's not actually your brother. But it does. It looks like a, a baby, right? It's a baby. And it's kind of hard to see because this picture is taken in a special place. Do you know where this baby is when the picture was taken? Where? Yeah, it's inside his or her mother. Yeah, it's kind of cool, isn't it, to think about that this is a picture of a baby inside that baby's mother. We're talking about something really special today. We're talking about life. And we're talking about who it is who makes babies alive. And do you know who it is who makes babies alive? It's God. God made you. And He didn't just make you like when you were born. You know you have a birthday. That's the day that you were born. But that's not the day that God started making you. Do you know where God was already making you? Inside your mother. Even before you were born, you were a real person whom God loved, whom God was creating and forming just so that you're you today. So you can remember every day of your life, God made me. Is that pretty cool? God made me. And I, I want you to remember that. Because sometimes people are going to tell you mean things. Do you ever hear people say mean things? At some point in your life, somebody's probably going to say to you, I don't like you. That's a pretty mean thing, right? Maybe in your life, somebody's going to say to you, oh, you're ugly. That'd be a pretty mean thing, right? And when somebody says those things to us, how do we feel? We still feel sad. I want you to know that even if other people say those mean things to you, do you know what's really true? God made you. And God loves you. And God saved you. And so it doesn't matter what anybody else says about you. From the moment you were a little baby inside your mother, to when you are now, to when you're a big person, and even when you're really old, God made you. And God loves you. And God wants you to always know and to believe that. We say a prayer. Let's fold our hands and bow our heads. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for babies like little Pearson who's with us today and all the other babies in our lives. We're thankful, Lord, that you made each one of us already when we were inside our mothers. You love each one of us every day. You saved us in Jesus. No matter what we hear in our lives, help us to remember that you made us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up here. Have a great day. God's words for our sermon today are words that you've heard once already. They're from Psalm 139, which we read responsibly before. But I'm going to read them for you again. Psalm 139, verses 13 to 18. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, 
I am still with you. This is God's word. The friends of Jesus, would you agree with me if I said that it seems in our society today that human life is becoming cheap? Maybe we could even say worthless. Why is that? I think I know at least one of the reasons. A few months ago in our, our Bible class, before church on Sunday morning, I, I read to you who are there a new children's book called Grandmother Fish. Any of you remember when I, I read you this book? I'm going to tell you the gist of it this morning. It's a colorful children's book. You open it up, and on, and on the first page, there's this picture of this colorful fish, and it says, This is our grandmother fish. She lived long, 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 long ago. Next, there's a, a reptile. It says, this is our grandmother reptile. She lived long, 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 long ago. Next comes a, a mammal. This is our grandmother mammal. She lived long, long, long ago. Next, an, an ape. It says, this is our grandmother ape. She lived long, long ago. Finally, a, a human. This is our grandmother human. She lived long ago. And there's so much more to the book. There's all these colorful pictures and engaging words. There's even at the end our evolutionary family tree that shows insects and mollusks and sharks and all of our other relatives. And you read this book and you realize it all, it all starts to make sense. The message of evolution is loud and clear. You are an animal. And not an extra special animal. You're, you're an animal. And you're an accident. You're just here completely by chance. And your life really doesn't have much of a purpose. Unless you count that in the grand scheme of the evolutionary process. Over millions of years we might evolve into something else. That's the message. Does it start to make sense? Why is human life becoming cheap and worthless? Because you're an animal. Did you know that an octopus lays 100,000 eggs all at the same time? So if many of them die before they grow to adulthood, who, who really cares, right? Even your dog, whom you, you love, when that dog gets old, what's, what are you going to do? You're going to put her down, right? When the buffalo herd at Yellowstone National Park grows too big, this is happening right now. When the buffalo herd grows too big, what, what needs to be done? Well, the herd gets, gets called, right? Those animals need to be gone. It's starting to make sense. So if there's a pregnancy that the baby isn't wanted, what should you do? Stand it. Right? If there's an elderly person who seems to now be living an unproductive life, what should be done? Put her down. Right? If a few million people happen to die from a certain sickness, who, who really cares? It's just calling the herd. Right? We call people animals. So we shouldn't be surprised when people act like animals. We teach that, that you're just a mistake, an accident, so we shouldn't be surprised when people feel like an accident, like a mistake. We, we teach that life is meaningless, and so we shouldn't be surprised when people act like life is meaningless. Why is it that human life seems so cheap, so worthless? It's because this is the dark world that we have decided to create for ourselves where we kill babies and ourselves. Agree? Today God wants to give you a totally different message. Today God wants you to hear something that you need to believe in His Word. Our Psalm King David wrote, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
That's quite a difference from grandmother fish, isn't it? King David said, God, you created my inmost being. You did it. You, God. I'm not an accident. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am not here by chance. You created my inmost being. You did it, God. It was you. Isn't that good to hear? You are not an accident. You are not an animal. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I love how the Bible compares God to an old lady. Did you catch that? David says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. That makes me think of our pins and needles sewing group here at church. Not that there's any old ladies in that group. It just makes me think of that, of that group in general. Have you ever watched someone knit something? It's a labor of love. Right? Stitch after stitch. Piece after piece. The patience. The time. The care. This is why I will never knit anything my whole life long. Right? I'll just buy it at Walmart. That's a whole lot easier. But when you buy that thing at Walmart, do you know what's missing? The love. The care. When you get that handmade, whatever it is, from your grandmother, I don't think your first thought is, oh, this is going to keep me warm. That's not what it's about. When you get that handmade thing, your first thought is, she loves me. She cares about me. This is proof. And now the Bible compares God to that grandmother. God didn't just pick you out at some big Walmart in the sky. Human beings are not mass produced in any way at all. God made you with his own hands. God made you you. Stitch by stitch. Piece by piece. God knit you together in your mother's womb. God made you male or female. God made you tall or short. God made you funny or serious. And God never for a moment wishes that you were like somebody else because God made you you. He knit you together in your mother's womb. And King David understood that. He can tell you, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. And David's talking about this great secret of how a baby develops inside his mother's womb. And just think about that. The little hands, they just pop out at right, just the right place. The heart starts beating. The lungs are ready to breathe. The, the moment that it's needed there's the gallbladder. I don't know what it does, but it's there, right? And God made that too. He, he knit us all together inside our mothers. Just because we can see it on an ultrasound today doesn't make it any less of a miracle. And here's the key word in what David writes. He says, I. When David was this unformed body inside his mother's womb, who was it who was there? I. Me. David realized something 3,000 years ago that the smartest people in our world today still can't figure out. That baby inside that mother's womb is, it's me. It's not an it. It's not an object. It's, it's me. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But God didn't stop when you were in the womb. Maybe the most amazing words in, in our lesson are what comes next. David says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And so before God sat down in his rocking chair to knit you together, he wrote down in his book everything that was going to happen in your life. The difficult breakup. The sickness. The day the baby was going to be born. The day the depression was going to set in. God wrote it down before you were even born. It's not just that you're not an accident. The Bible's message is not, not a single day of your life is an accident either. God knew and God knows the joys and the sorrows. The good times and the struggles. God had it written in his book. 
God's in control. God has your life in his hand. And that made King David say, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, you are still with me. You want to feel precious? Think about God's thoughts. Especially think about God's thoughts about you. Because these are God's thoughts about you. I knit you together in your mother's womb. I have written down every day that's going to happen in your life. Every morning when you awake, I am still with you. You don't have to believe the lie of evolution. You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God loves life. He loves every human life. So why don't we? Maybe you say, what do you mean? I'm pro life. I love life too. Here's a criticism that I hear people make of Christians who claim to be pro life. I've heard people say, you Christians, you claim to be pro life, but you only care about unborn babies. What about the people who are actually born? What about the people around you in your life? Why don't you show that you care for them? You know, when I've heard that criticism, I've, I've had to think to myself, there's, there's truth in that. So you're pro-life, huh? Why is it that you never talk to the person sitting behind you here at church today? So you say you're, you're pro-life. Why is it that when you see someone in need or sick, you don't feel one bit of concern for them. So you're pro-life. Well, how is it then that there's those people that you don't like? Why are you so happy when things go wrong for them? Is that at home? That's for me. You know, it's, it's actually easier to love unborn babies in somebody else's womb whom I will never have to care for it's easier to love them than to love the person sitting next to me. Can you see the problem? You know why that is? In God's Word today, we see a strange connection. This sermon lesson is from Psalm 139. that was written by King David. King David also wrote Psalm 51, which are the words that we use for our confession of sins today. And when you compare the two, you realize that a pretty interesting connection. King David wrote in Psalm 139, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And yet what was it that we confessed when we confessed our sins? Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So which one is it? I was fearfully and wonderfully made, or I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, which is true. Both. Both are true. God fearfully and wonderfully made each one of us, but from the moment that you and I were conceived, there was a different power at work in our lives. It was the power of sin. Sin that affects us from the moment we were, we were conceived. God has created a perfect world, but sin has corrupted it. It's corrupted us. So that our desires are not God's desires, and our thoughts are not God's thoughts. And you know, whatever the sin is, we like to make the excuse, well, I was born that way. Except it doesn't work, because every one of us were born sinful. Sin has corrupted us from the moment of conception. You see that in how we, we treat other people. We have to confess that in our hearts. God is the perfect creator. I'm like a, a wrecking ball. God is pure. I'm dust. Like the dust God made people from in the, the first place. There are these two powers that work in our world. It's 100% true to say... God has made me fearfully and wonderfully. That is true, but it's also 100% true to say, surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And that sin is nowhere more clear than the way that we treat other human beings 
and realize that the way we treat other human beings shows exactly what we think of our God because he's the one who made all of us. One day, you are going to have to stand before your creator. Why wouldn't God just squash us like bugs? Because God became one of us. If you still have any doubt about how special human life is, then, then ponder this. God actually became one of us. God didn't just knit each one of us together in our mother's wombs. God was knitted together in the womb of Mary, his mother. God became one of us. Imagine that in, in your garage at home, there's a little frog that's stuck. It's just hopping around. Does this happen to your garage? And you being the kind people that you try to be, you, you pick up the frog in your hand, you take it outside, and you put it in the yard, right? You saved it. Good job. Jesus saved us. But Jesus didn't just pick up the frog. Jesus became a frog. Would you be willing to do that? But Jesus didn't just like he became a frog. He became a frog, and then... He died for all the other frogs. And you're thinking, Pastor, this is getting stupid. Right? This doesn't make any sense at all. Why on earth would anybody even think about becoming a frog? It doesn't make any sense. And that's what Jesus did for us, right? There is a bigger difference between God and us than there is between us and a frog. And yet God became one of us. Jesus lived for us. And then he died for us. And he rose for us. You want to know how special life is? God took on our life and gave his life for us. That's why I love the, the, the song that we sang just before the sermon today. My worth is not in what I own. Not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. You want to know how much you're worth? Look at the cross of Jesus where our God who fearfully and wonderfully made us, where our God who has laid out every day of our lives, that God was willing to die for us, to take all of our sins our way. The power of the cross is what breaks the power of sin. Jesus is our master now. He's our Lord. He is our Savior. I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It's that grace of God that makes Christians pro-life. It's not a political thing. It has nothing to do with any political party. It's the grace of God and Jesus that makes us want to see every baby live because we want every baby be able to be baptized. We want every child to believe in Jesus as their Savior so that every person one day can be in heaven with Jesus. It's the grace of Jesus that leads Christians to be pro-life, starting with the unborn, but not stopping there. Every single human being is fearfully and wonderfully made. Every single one, every single human being needs to know about God's grace. The world wears us down. Our guilt hangs on us. Being pro-life means being pro-people. Maybe start with this. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Does it sound strange to do that? It shouldn't, right? It shouldn't. This is what we're here for as Christians, to encourage each other with the gospel. Now turn to somebody else and say the same thing. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's not just something we're saying at church. This is the truth from God. Nobody here is an accident. Nobody here is a mistake. Every one of us is a creation of God. Get used to saying that to other people. To telling people you are special. God loves you. You're the creation of God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. But not just other people. Not just the people sitting around you. Do you know the person in your life 
who most needs the gospel on a daily basis? You do. You do. So now I want you to say it to yourself. Say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now say it like you mean it. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That is true for you. On all of those days in your life when you struggle with your identity, when you wonder, who am I? Remember God's promise to you. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When you feel worthless, you have worth. In the cross of Jesus, when you feel like your life has no meaning, you have meaning. In the cross of Jesus, when you feel like you have no purpose, you have purpose in the cross of Jesus. Because God loves human life. And if God loves human life, do you know whom God loves? You. Say it with me one more time. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, it saddens us to look around our society and see how cheap human life is. There's abortion. There's euthanasia. There's, on top of that, evolution, suicide, and war, and violence. Lord, it, it seems like life no longer has meaning. As we see that around us, Lord, we have to confess we're, we're part of that. We look at the people in our lives, we don't, we don't talk to them. We don't share your gospel with them. We don't show concern for them. In fact, sometimes when people go through hard times, we're happy because it makes us feel better about ourselves. Dear Jesus, we have to confess that we were sinful from birth and we sinned every day of our lives. And yet you became one of us. You took on flesh and blood. You allowed yourself to be knitted together so that you could prove how much you love us, so that you could take away the sins of the world. Dear Lord Jesus, as we grow in your love for us, help us to grow in our love for people. Help us to be pro-life for every person and to tell the people around us, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing another song that, again, is newer for us. But it has a beautiful message about how it's God who holds us fast. So you'll notice it's in our, our worship folders on pages 12 and 13. Let's sing together, He will hold me fast.
For our confession of faith today, we're going to use just the first article, the first part of the Apostles' Creed. And then we're going to read together Martin Luther's explanation, which beautifully lays out what God has done to create us and preserve us as we go through life. Please stand as we confess our faith in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God created me and all that exists, and that he gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my mind and all my abilities. And I believe that God still preserves me by richly and daily providing clothing and shoes, food and drink, property and home, spouse and children, land, cattle, and all I own, and all I need to keep my body and life. God also preserves me by defending me against all danger, guarding and protecting me from all evil. All this God does only because he is my good and merciful Father in heaven, and not because I have earned or deserved it. For all this I ought to thank and praise, to serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Go to God now with our prayer of the church. The first part will be a responsive prayer. You can see it on the screens or on pages 14 and 15. And we'll have a, a number of prayers for people in our congregation before the Lord's Prayer. Go to God in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, when mankind threw the gift of eternal life with you away in the Garden of Eden, you restored it to them with the gift of your Son, Jesus. Give us the strength to share the promise of forgiveness with those who are hurting, with those who have no hope, with those who do not yet know you. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator and the preserver of life. It is you who knits the child together in their mother's womb. As we consider how wonderfully you made us, help us to grow in our appreciation for your wisdom and power. We ask you to open the eyes of those who, practice the, who embrace the practice of abortion. Lead them to cherish the life you create in the womb. Help anyone who has had, encouraged, or performed an abortion to realize that they have complete forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you know everything about us. You know that at times we have too much loved and lived for ourselves, too little loved and lived for you, and too little loved our neighbor as ourselves. Forgive us, Father. And give us an unwavering love and trust in you. Move us to love our neighbor by speaking up for those who cannot speak for themselves. That we may protect the life of the born and the unborn. Almighty and eternal God, you alone know the number of our days. Yet many today say that people have the right to terminate life according to their own wishes. Help us to realize that no matter what hardship we are facing, each day you give us on this earth is a precious gift. Help us to understand that you use hardships in our lives to draw us closer to yourself. Almighty and, merc and eternal God, in your mercy, hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they too may know the joy of receiving your help in their need. Dear Jesus, we pray for a number of people who need you in a special way this week. We pray for the co-worker of our member, Ross Miller. This co-worker's wife is both struggling with cancer and pregnant at the same time. She receives treatment for this cancer, Lord. We ask that you protect her life and the life of their child. We ask, Lord, that through your power, that you'd heal her, allow this baby to be born healthy and strong. Give this family faith in you in this difficult time. We pray for our member, Tom Temple, who was hospitalized again this weekend. We ask that you guide the nurses and doctors who are caring for him. We ask that their treatments would work. That you'd allow him to breathe better. That you'd stabilize his blood counts. That he'd be able to go home to his wife soon. We pray for the sister of our member, Sam Reed, for Barb, who's been diagnosed with bone cancer. 
Lord, she has difficult decisions to make about what treatments to receive, where to receive them, and how to proceed in her days here on earth. We ask that you give her wisdom. We ask that you bless whatever the decision is. Especially we ask that you give her faith in you as she faces this challenge in her life. We pray for Eleanor, the mother-in-law of our member, John Christ. It seems like Eleanor is dying, and maybe today will even be her last day on earth. We ask that in her final moments you give her the, the picture of your cross on her mind, that you died for her, so that even though she dies, she can know she has eternal life. Keep her strong in her faith to the end. And may she receive your gift of eternal life through Jesus. Finally, dear Lord, in, in our nation today, the practice of abortion continues, and yet there is hope that perhaps someday, maybe someday soon, laws would be changed and that practice would be stopped. Dear Lord, we ask that you move the hearts of people to return to you, to repent of their sins, to hear your word, and to protect the lives that you have created. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We go today with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Maybe see it for our, our closing song. Go, my children, with my blessing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>